Peter Bogenstrand and Vadim. The title of the talk is Study of the Service Act of Science of an Adding Holiday Catalyst for Select Oxidation and Oxidation Protein. A little background for Professor Vadim, our speaker. He finished Moscow University in 87. Then he decided to come to America. He finished his PhD uh, from the University of Princeton. Uh, he came to the department in 95, was the French here, and got away to a good extent with later the wax. And uh, then he decided to join uh, industry. He worked for 30 to 40 years with Praxair, doing a lot of interesting things with separations. And then uh, he did the right thing to move to academia, and he joined our department. Uh, since then, he has been uh, very active in several nice areas. He developed a lot of nice things in his lab, and I think he got his uh, promotion a few days ago, right? Last promotion. <laughs> so he got retired now. That's the nice thing about academia. <laughs> I don't want to take more time, and uh, I give the microphone to Vadim to say his final Thank you. Peter, thank you for the nice introduction. Well, we're very busy now, so it's not time for retirement. Uh, this work was done uh, in my group here at NUC and also in collaboration with uh, another faculty member in our department, uh, uh, BJ Vasudev, who's an expert in, uh, in microscopy, as well as uh, Hida Brongerson at the University of Eindhoven. This is uh, perhaps an update on the presentation that I gave uh, uh, for Tri-State just last, last spring. And uh, in addition to looking at uh, surface compositions of these materials, really not all surface compositions. We've done a, a study of uh, alcohol absorption by carbon model systems and investigated also the changes in the surface composition as a result of, of uh, alcohol cam absorption and uh, uh, temperature program absorption. So I will share some of our insights with you today. The motivation for uh, looking at propane oxidation and M oxidation comes from environmental and, uh, and economic considerations, uh, uh, especially due to the uh, uh, rising prices for fossil fuels, including natural gas, which is the, uh, uh, um, provide, uh, provides a foundation for uh, uh, the attraction of this process. And uh, the, uh, the proposed typical uh, pathway goes through uh, uh, the step of uh, oxidative dehydrogenation to propylene. Propylene right here, and then uh, uh, through to oh, thank you, and then through to selective oxidation products, uh, which is acrylic acid. Or if you introduce ammonia in the feed, uh, it goes to acrylic nitrile. Acrylic nitrile is being a more economically stable molecule than acrylic acid. The results in the fact that uh, typically these catalysts are more selective to acrylic nitrile than to uh, acrylic acid for the same catalyst. Um, if one looks at the current uh, candidate systems, uh, one would immediately notice that molybdenum and vanadium are the dominant, uh, the dominant components for the catalysts that are mostly selective and active for both reactions. And you can see yields uh, uh, close to 62% reported for uh, propanium oxidation over some uh, uh, optimized, uh, optimized model systems here. That was a publication in Topics and Catholics a couple of years ago uh, from the group of Grassell in collaboration with Simix and also the University of Delaware people as well. So uh, uh, this system that contains these four magical components uh, uh, appears to be the most promising. And it contains so-called M1 of two phases. M stands for Mitsubishi, one of two phases, uh, uh, proposed and active and selective. So how do you uh, make these catalysts? Well, it starts with uh, combining the metal oxide uh, sources, <coughs> primarily as salts, uh, soluble in water, followed by hydrothermal treatment at, at uh, uh, 175 degrees C for different uh, periods of time, depending on the, uh, the composition. And it so happens that you can make at least in one phase that's supposed to be the, uh, the most active and selective for these reactions in binary molybdenum vanadium in uh, uh, three-component molybdenum vanadium tellurium and four-component molybdenum vanadium tellurium niobium oxide systems. And that sets the foundation for comparing and investigating the roles of these metal oxide components for oxidation and oxidation. This is uh, uh, what uh, X-ray diffraction patterns of these phases look like. And you can convince yourself that if you utilize uh, hydrothermal synthesis, then the M1 phase is the dominant phase. 
uh, and one of them do have quite similar crystal structures, similar enough that uh, it's very difficult to discern the presence of even a significant impurity of the M2 phase when M1 phase is dominant, and M2 is typically manifested by a peak at about 28.3 degrees uh, to theta. And if you don't see a lot of intensity here, then it suggests that you don't really have a lot of M2 in your material. Uh, this is kind of to give you a rough idea of the morphologies of these uh, catalysts that are prepared hydrothermally. Uh, they possess this rod-like morphology, typically elongated uh, uh, needle-like crystals, and the cross-sections uh, uh, could be also quite, quite interesting in, in, <laughs> in, in appearance. When one looks at the uh, binary mode of the vanadium catalyst, then it, one sees a, a lot more disorder, typically, as compared to three-component, four-component catalysts. This is our work that uh, 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 is in preparation to be submitted. And you can look at the binary catalyst, and you can see that uh, binary catalyst especially represents a very elongated needles. And at high magnification, what one convince yourself is that, uh, probably not borne out very well by this micrograph, but there's a lot of uh, tiny bits here at these basic faces. <coughs> and if one looks at uh, uh, TEM of these crystals that are sectioned, then one can convince yourself that if you want to look uh, along the long axis of these, of these crystals, then they are presented very thin slabs of, of crystallites that look like bricks. And you can also see that a lot of these bricks are missing. And they're, they, they're not missing because they fell out okay, during the sectioning of these uh, the sample. But they actually believe that they're not there because they didn't form okay, uh, during the catalyst synthesis. And you can actually see that quite uh, eloquently when you look at the uh, cross section of, of, of a rod. And you can see uh, larger areas, and these are the bricks that are missing. And there are also much smaller lighter areas, which we believe perhaps correspond to uh, grain boundaries, where the crystallites are not uh, uh, tightly packed in a, in a, in a rod-like in, in a, in a rod assembly. When one looks at the performance of these catalysts in both reactions, and again, uh, what's borne out is that the, uh, the same system is more typically more selective and act, uh, more selective for formation of pyrrole nitrile than it is for formation of pyrrolic acid. And, and these are data that will be published very soon. And you can see that tellurium and niobium are quite important for the cell activity. So molybdenum and vanadium sites are sufficient to activate propane, but it doesn't happen selectively. So you really need to have to have these two components together uh, to do this reaction very effectively uh, and efficiently. These are the uh, this is the crystal structure of the one phase published and confirmed recently uh, by uh, uh, synchrotronic SRD and powder neutron diffraction uh, by a group of uh, Doug Butcher University of Delaware. You can see that this is a pretty complex structure. It has these large uh, channels that run uh, normal to the uh, uh, AB planes that are proposed by Grisella to contain the active and selective sites in this system. And the M2 phase is uh, similar. It's also layered uh, phase, just like M1. And the separation between the layers is about four angstrom, similar to molybdenum trioxide. But the channels are smaller. Channels that run normal to the AB plane here. And in our previous study published, uh, published recently, what we established is that if, if one looks at the three model catalysts that, uh, that uh, uh, possess slightly different uh, exposure of the AP planes, then one uh, obtains some kind of partial evidence that the relative exposure of AP planes of one phase correlates uh, with selectivity to acrylic acid. So we, we seem to, to observe that. Okay, so apparently the AP planes of one phase may indeed uh, be the uh, location of the active and, and selective surface sites. Okay? And this is the hypothetical mechanism that, that was proposed by Grisselli uh, based on the presence of uh, uh, hypothetical active sites in the bulk eight planes of the one phase. And so the idea is that the activation begins uh, uh, by propane activation over the native 5 plus site. So uh, that's why the native 5, 5 plus site is critical for this reaction. And then the other sites, uh, 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 molybdenum 6, tellurium 4, um, uh, provide uh, the uh, locations of sites for further steps. And uh, niobium serves uh, in this mechanism by providing site isolation. So these are pentagonal bipyramids. 
and they kind of pin uh, the center and, and, and separate the spatial from other sides, and, and that uh, is better. That, that improves the selectivity in the selective oxidation. And by looking at the uh, uh, elemental compositions uh, of these AD blades, they're able to uh, predict uh, the maximum selectivity uh, for this reaction. And that's what they uh, that, that's what they predicted a couple of years ago. Now they up the numbers a little bit based on improved uh, elemental composition of the uh, AB plane. But again, this is, again, I, I want to stress the hypothetical model based on the uh, structure and composition of the bulk planes. Also recently, uh, another group from, from Germany, uh, Robert Schlodel, uh, seemed to provide evidence that the nanocrystals of some partially reduced vanadium suboxide uh, were supported on this bulk molybdenum vanadium tellurium myopia phase. And they seem to propose that these sites uh, these nanocrystalline uh, uh, entities were responsible, maybe involved in, in selection oxidation and oxidation. But all in all, there has been no study of the uh, active surface sites directly uh, and the uh, active surface directly. Uh, uh, and, and so our, our interest was to explore, uh, investigate the system, and provide the, the, these uh, this fundamental information. So I'm going to talk to you uh, and hopefully convince you uh, uh, in two things, that uh, one can uh, certainly uh, 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 investigate the active surface sites by this promising low energy ion scattering technique in combination with uh, careful uh, uh, kinetic studies, uh, and then uh, uh, also utilize the uh, chem absorption and reaction to surface probe molecules in combination with uh, low energy ion scattering to provide additional information about the nature of the active surface. So just a little bit about low energy ion scattering technique. Uh, this is not a new technique. Ice scanning is not a new technique. It's been uh, it's been around for uh, uh, several decades. The advantage of the uh, uh, of the uh, method that uh, we have access to through collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Bronderson, who actually gave a presentation in late May here in this in this club, <coughs> is uh, a revolutionary uh, design for the uh, uh, energy uh, uh, sensitive detector. So essentially, instead of using a single detector, a huge number, uh, essentially 2,000 uh, parallel detectors is used to detect uh, uh, ions coming off the surface, and that has an impact on increasing sensitivity of this detection without incurring immediate surface damage that's, uh, that's uh, inherent in this technique. The idea of the technique is that you bombard a surface with uh, noble gas ions such as uh, helium and neon, and the energies of these, uh, of these ions after recoil from the surface are going to be changed due to elastic collisions with uh, surface atoms. Okay, and so analyzing the uh, uh, the concentration of ions coming off the surface and their energies, one can then tell uh, the surface concentration of elements in just the topmost surface. Okay, so there's no subsurface information, uh, which typically comes from using another uh, uh, surface region sensitive technique such as XPS. Okay, so this technique. Uh, by contrast with XPS, is truly topmost surface sensitive. Of course, when you have a multi-component uh, metal oxide, the challenge comes from ability to accurately determine concentrations of all metal oxides on the surface. And, uh, and, and ability to do that depends on also on how closely the elements are in the periodic table. And you can actually see that if you use a typical helium plus uh, helium uh, ion beam to study the surface compositions, then the molybdenum and tellurium and actually niobium may not be separated by just using one uh, noble gas ion, such as helium, and <coughs> uh, employ a different uh, heavier ion, such as neon plus. And when you do that, then you can separate molybdenum and tellurium and actually niobium, which is not shown here for the component system. So there is a way to convolute uh, the contributions and quantify contributions of all surface metal oxides for this technique. And so uh, we employed this method to look at the, uh, uh, at the composition of three component and one phase catalyst. And what we observed is that the, only the uh, topmost surface composition was different from that of the bulk. And when you selectively remove just uh, uh, approximately one monolayer coolant of metal oxides inches from the surface, then the composition to the subsurface becomes almost immediately similar to, uh, to that of the bulk, which is shown here on the outmost uh, right. And so, but also what you see is uh, the surface is relatively enriched in, in, in vanadium uh, and, and uh, depleted in molybdenum as compared to uh, 
compared to the bulk, and also slightly increased, uh, slightly enriched in delirium as well as compared to the bulk. Okay, but again, what's important is that the uh, the subsurface already has composition that's pretty much uh, very similar to that of the bulk. So there's some changes, some differences between the surface and the bulk, and that shows the limitation of hypothetical models that based on the bulk compositions of mixed metal oxides. Now we'll look at the, uh, uh, again using low energy ion scattering, uh, we'll look at the composition of the four component catalyst, which is the hydrothermal Mitsubishi M1 phase type catalyst, we saw actually quite different results. What we saw is that the surface was actually depleted in uh, vanadium, both vanadium and molybdenum as compared to the bulk. And these are the bulk compositions right here. So this is our uh, molybdenum signal, and, uh, and this is uh, vanadium signal. Okay, and this is uh, in, in the dotted lines correspond to uh, the bulk composition okay, uh, in, uh, in this catalyst. And what you see is that, uh, again, the topmost surface composition is different. So the surface is enriched in tellurium and enriched in niobium oxide species and is depleted in vanadium and molybdenum. Uh, next, uh, next step was to look at uh, whether there are any changes that occur in the surface of this catalyst as, as, as uh, the uh, experimental conditions change. Again, this is a line of sight technique where essentially uh, the ions uh, only see the surface that, uh, that they, they, they have access to. Okay, so you cannot access the entire surface area of the sample by this technique, but only what the ions see when they collide with the surface. Another limitation is that this is a high vacuum technique. And so you're not able to look at the catal catalytic surface uh, directly in situ under working conditions. So it's a high uh, high vacuum technique, and so you can only observe changes in the catalyst surface when you pretreat the sample in a uh, in an adjacent uh, environmental chamber uh, that uh, this particular ion scattering technique does have. Okay, and so what you can also do is you can essentially uh, take this catalyst and heat it up to uh, a typical experimental uh, uh, propane oxidation and amoxidation temperature, which is about 400 degrees Celsius and uh, in, in high vacuum, and then look at the changes in the surface composition. And you can see that there are some changes here, but they're not very dramatic. So when you get up the sample to 400 degrees C, what you observe is that molybdenum concentration drops a little bit, and so slightly does vanadium concentration, okay? And then uh, essentially all of, uh, all of these uh, components uh, decrease in concentration as uh, as a function of, uh, of that temperature. But the changes are, are slight. There's not a big change. There's not a fundamental change in the surface concentrations. And then once you begin to remove, to, uh, to, uh, to spot away uh, the surface, after you move about one mono layer, you're again getting pretty close to the ball compositions of the system. So essentially, the biggest changes are limited to just the topmost surface, okay? So that's a very important conclusion. Uh, and so if one looks at, uh, at these two models uh, uh, that were proposed previously, one is a hypothetical model based on the uh, uh, composition of the bulk in planes proposed by Buscelli, and, uh, and the model that uh, uh, were uh, nano, nanoparticles of reduced vanadium oxide phase supported on the bulk for component mixed metal oxide were proposed. Uh, our uh, low energy ion scatter results uh, essentially indicate that uh, these, these models are not very accurate. The actual surface is terminated with a, a, a model layer that's uh, different from the bulk, but everything below that model layer looks very similar to that in the bulk. Okay? Uh, from, uh, from the results uh, of the study, where we looked at the surface composition of M1 catalyst uh, for, three different, uh, for three different bulk compositions, we were able to correlate the reaction rates where the surface vanadium concentration as well as the uh, concentrations of other species such as molybdenum tellurium. This was done for the three component molybdenum vanadium tellurium oxide catalyst with M1 phase composition. And essentially what we saw is that, uh, first of all, the reaction orders were significantly uh, greater than one uh, for uh, protein consumption and, and the formation of uh, propylene and acrylic acid. This suggested that uh, the multiple sites uh, apparently were more efficient in, in uh, activating propane and forming uh, propylene and acrylic acid and other reaction, reaction products and reaction intermediates. And second of all, what we also observed is that there was no correlation 
between these reaction rates and selectivities and the concentrations of the other species. So uh, it looked like uh, the, there was a pretty strong correlation with uh, surface vanadium content, but not with uh, other, other species uh, in the surface. In the second, uh, in the second part of my presentation, I'm going to uh, briefly touch upon the promise and challenges of using uh, alcohols and surface probes of uh, active surface sites uh, for uh, mixed metal oxides. And uh, uh, I'm going to try not to, not to steal thunder from our uh, keynote speaker later today. And I'm going to just briefly describe uh, uh, the, uh, the essence of, uh, of uh, using alcohols as probes of the active surface sites. Uh, there is a great deal of very careful uh, fundamental work that, that was done by our keynote speaker in, uh, in, in, in several years, uh, uh, last several years, to employ alcohols as essentially chemical probes capable of providing detailed information about the number and nature of the active surface sites. And this very careful work was initially done uh, for uh, monolayer supported catalysts. A typical example would be uh, a system for example, it contains isolated uh, surface vanadiosides supported on another, uh, another metal oxide, such as niobium. And uh, perhaps uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, proposed and uh, confirmed models for getting absorption of, let's say, methanol or, uh, on, on a surface like that would be formation of surface methoxy that's uh, coordinated to a, a, a surface vanadyl 5 plus species information of surface hydroxide species as well. And then uh, followed by partial dehydration of the surface uh, to uh, remove water. And so uh, that system essentially uh, provides surface methoxy species. And because of the finite size of the methoxy surface methoxy, uh, there's going to be a repulsion between uh, a surface methoxy species. And so not every single metal oxide size will be able to uh, form a surface methoxy. And so typically, there's a correction factor introduced uh, to, uh, 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 to calculate the true number of surface uh, active sites by multiplying the number of surface methoxies by approximately uh, a, a factor of three uh, to account for the true number of uh, active metal oxide species present on the surface. The situation with mixed metal oxides is a little bit more, uh, 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 I guess, challenging and uncertain because, because of uh, uh, uncertain uh, uh, geometry and, and coordination chemistry of metal oxide species in the topmost surface. And therefore, if one has a, uh, a, a model layer on top of a bulk mixed metal oxide, there are clearly two possibilities for it to interact, with, let's say, with methanol or another alcohol uh, to form a, uh, a methoxy species on vanadio or methoxy species on molybdenum. So there are two, two scenarios that are possible. And, uh, and recently, uh, 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 Israel Wax uh, with coworkers demonstrated that you can actually uh, uh, use uh, methanol as a chemical probe to successfully differentiate the, uh, the active surface sites present also in uh, mixed metal oxides as well. Uh, the uh, essentially uh, uh, critical information comes from the uh, temperature at which uh, methanol decomposes to give a certain reaction products. So if you uh, can absorb methanol and then conduct temperature per graph surface reaction from the systems, beyond removing some of the uh, desorbed methanol or recombined uh, uh, methanol to desorb as an uh, unreactive species on the surface, one typically observes uh, formation of formaldehyde. And the temperature, the maximum temperature for evolution of formaldehyde depends on the nature of the active surface species. And vanadium uh, 5 plus species being more reactive typically form uh, formaldehyde at a lower temperature, approximately 50 degrees Celsius lower than what's observed for surface molybdenum 6 plus species. Okay, and this is manifested, for example, for a supported metal, metal oxide uh, that contains 1% of vanadium, 6% of molybdenum uh, on uh, niobium oxide, which kind of corresponds roughly to probably modulator or slightly above modulator coverage, combined modulator coverage for both species. And what you see is that the uh, formaldehyde decomposes at about 183 degrees Celsius on the surface, which is typical for the 85 plus species. So you can clearly differentiate that on, on this system, vanadium, uh, 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 surface vanadium oxide species are essentially uh, active in, in this reaction. 
And when you look at uh, the same kind of reaction for, uh, uh, let's say, bulk uh, binary molybdenum vanadium and, and four component molybdenum vanadium tellurium and iodine oxide species, then you would see that uh, uh, formaldehyde evolves also at very similar temperature, about 183, 188 degrees Celsius. And that also suggested that uh, vanadium, the, the, the activity of, of these catalysts were dominated by the surface vanadium 5 plus species. And curiously also for the four component system, there was a difference in, uh, in the products that were obtained in this reaction because uh, formaldehyde was not the only product. There was also formation of dimethyl ether, which is uh, 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 results from the presence of uh, uh, acidic sites on the surface. And, uh, and, and, and the study was concluded that it was uh, uh, predominantly molybdenum 6 plus that provided acidity to form uh, dimethyl, ether, dimethyl ether. What we've done is we've investigated uh, uh, methanol and allyl alcohol as per molecule can absorption and reaction on, on similar two catalysts uh, with uh, similar ball compositions. And I'm going to just briefly summarize the major results that we obtained in the study. So what you're looking at here are the various steps uh, during methanol can absorption, desorption, and regeneration of the surface. And so what you're looking at here for the bulk four component catalyst is the composition of uh, the surface composition of this catalyst. And again, what you what you see here immediately is that vanadium oxide is not a dominant surface metal oxide species in a in a topmost surface. Actually. Uh, basically, uh, molybdenum is a dominant ball component and also dominant in the topmost surface. And what's interesting is that once you absorb uh, methanol on the system, there's a considerable drop in the, uh, in the uh, signal from all the uh, metal oxide and actually surface oxygen species. And this is the sum of uh, uh, fractions for surface metal oxide species. And by looking at the change, you can actually see that approximately uh, uh, 60 to 80 percent of the surface is occupied by, by methoxy. Okay, again, this is uh, how it's seen by essentially helium and neon ions that, that are uh, bombarded, okay, that are directed at the surface. What's also interesting is that once you uh, go from the absorbed state to desorbed, uh, uh, even prolonged desorption, which is done at, uh, by heating the sample to 400 degrees C in vacuum, what you see is that there's really not a big change in the, uh, in the uh, total uh, surface uh, metal oxide concentration. This kind of suggests that uh, under these conditions, there's a very partial removal of the surface oxide species. So apparently the mixed metal oxide, this particular mixed metal oxide, is not very active. In, it doesn't have very active oxygen species in the surface to remove uh, the chemisorb methoxy species. So only uh, a small amount of methoxy is removed by even prolonged desorption at 400 degrees C in vacuum uh, from the surface. And so uh, much more uh, invasive treatment is required. Typically a brief uh, treatment with uh, atomic oxygen is required to remove the surface uh, methoxy species. But what's interesting is once you, uh, once you remove uh, uh, surface carbonation species, and, and the total uh, surface metal oxide fractions go back up to 100%, yet the, uh, the composition of, uh, of that surface is now uh, different from the composition of the initial surface. And this is, again, this is the bulk composition. So what it suggests to us is that after we remove the surface carbonation species, there's some change in the, uh, in the composition of the topmost surface layer. So, Apparently, the chemisorption and desorption of alcohols may, uh, 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 may uh, induce possibly uh, surface reconstruction in the topmost surface layer by the conditions of this uh, uh, simulated temperature per gram uh, uh, surface reaction. One another important conclusion is that uh, there was slight preference of surface vanadium sites uh, to form surface methoxy species over surface molybdenum sites. And, and surface tellurium and iodine sites experienced very little surface coverage by, uh, by, uh, by the methoxy species. And also, what's, what's interesting is that the, uh, the binary catalyst certainly experienced much greater decrease uh, uh, 
much, much greater decrease in the surface uh, metal oxide signals. Uh, so this catalyst was covered much more significantly by the thoxy species than the four component catalyst. So it, it contained a greater number of surface active sites. And that's understandable because of the higher uh, vanadium content uh, in, in the system as well. So if, if one looks at the data in the preceding graph and, and, and calculates them uh, by uh, looking at the relative surface uh, signals, setting the surface signal in the initial clean surface to one, that these are the changes in these ratios that one uh, sees once, uh, uh, once goes through uh, absorption, desorption, and cleaning steps. And so these, uh, these graphs actually emphasize much, to a much more significant extent uh, conclusions that, uh, that, that, that I made uh, uh, looking at the data in the preceding graph. And so what you see is that there's a much, there's somewhat more significant drop in the uh, uh, surface vanadium signal as compared to surface uh, molybdenum signal indicating preferential occupancy of, uh, of uh, surface vanadium species by, uh, by surface methoxy groups. And also that after, after cleaning the surface, uh, we have a much uh, significant difference in the topmost surface composition with that in the original surface. So essentially, uh, the, the one cycle of of, of this uh, of cake absorption and temperature per gram reaction uh, produces a different surface at the end than the surface that we started off with. Okay? And the same conclusion was also reached for the binary catalyst. We also try to look at the allo alcohol uh, cake absorption and reaction because allo alcohol kind of simulated to us an intermediate in propane oxidation and amoxidation reaction. So we wanted to see if allo alcohol would be more discerning probe than methanol this case. And in fact, it, it was. So this is a similar graph that, uh, 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 that was obtained uh, 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 for surface fractions for the uh, four-component catalyst and two-component catalyst. And remember that the four-component catalyst is much more selective in both uh, oxidation and amoxidation propane and the binary catalyst that essentially was unselected. And uh, what's interesting is that now for alcohol, Surface vanadium sites were much more discriminating than even molybdenum sites in can absorbing, uh, can absorbing these species. And this is actually borne out much more significantly here in, uh, in these two graphs. What's interesting is that, so, uh, that vanadium sites were occupied by a factor of 3.1 uh, by higher concentration of uh, uh, surface alcohol species. And this, in reason, this, uh, this uh, preference for the binary catalyst was a lot less significant. So the factor of 1.3 was found uh, versus surface uh, molybdenum species. So clearly, uh, uh, alcohol has a uh, greater discriminating ability than, than methanol uh, to, uh, to titrate the surface vanadium sites on the top of the surface. And again, what you see is that uh, there's a, uh, a lot less significant extent of occupation uh, uh, of surface niobia and telluric sites by the, uh, by the uh, surface allo uh, um, species, allo alcohol species. And then also desorption, standard desorption in vacuum at 400 BC, even in the case of allo alcohol, is not very effective, not very efficient in removing these surface species. So clearly, that surface is not as active as that of the uh, uh, supported uh, metal oxides in, in converting the uh, surface alkoxy species into, uh, into oxidation products. And also what's important is that after we clean up the surface by, by employing uh, 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 atomic oxygen, uh, the surface does not return back to the pristine state. Okay, so clearly there's either some reconstruction or possible removal of some of the uh, surface species, uh, metal oxide species, perhaps as organic metallic, volatile organic metallic species. So, so these are the changes that, that one observes. Okay? So uh, with that, I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, the initial study uh, of the active, uh, uh, catalytic surface of the four component highly selective oxidation and oxidation catalyst uh, reveal that the active sites are created by specific surface termination and that the composition of <coughs> subsurface layers is essentially identical to that of the bulb. When one looks at the bad catalyst for, this, for these reactions versus the good catalyst, 
One observes that 80% uh, of the surface is covered by organ oxide uh, versus, I would say, 30 to 40% that's indicated by, uh, uh, by the uh, studies of monolayer supported catalysts. Uh, that's uh, one possible explanation for that is that, uh, uh, is that the, the way uh, the uh, surface of accessibility is, is sampled by the low energy ion scattering utilizing finite size of uh, helium and neon ions. Uh, what's also interesting is that the, uh, the temperature, the simulated temperature per gram surface reaction that was conducted in low energy ion scattering studies uh, removed the surface species partially. And at this point, uh, the question is whether it's a, uh, a, a consequence of high vacuum uh, conditions of this experiment, or whether the active catalyst, which is mixed metal oxide, called mixed metal oxide, is less sufficient at, at converting the surface alkoxides which is into, into the same products that, that are observed uh, by regular uh, temperature per gram uh, surface reaction studies. And, and, and also uh, uh, something that's not observed, in, in the, uh, at least there's no evidence in the uh, studies of model layer support catalyst, there seems to be a uh, evidence of surface reconstruction as a result of, this, of a single cycle of uh, uh, alcohol gain absorption and damage program uh, surface reaction study that, that needs to be looked at uh, more carefully. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the granting agencies for support, uh, current and former group members, uh, their contributions, very valuable as well as collaborators, which is uh, Peter Brunkers, my, and also Professor Russell Devon in, in our department. And I'd, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for Reed's presentation. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, thank you for the education. <laughs> your follow-up studies. We, we, it's always known that we absorb a molecule and have this structure. I have a question, though. When you uh, do not you, but bunkers, or whatever his name is, and I told you, do a little ion, energy ion scattering, um, and you say you take away a monolayer. I mean, you really can't take away a monolayer because these powders are random, and and you're so you cannot like literally like onion peel off a layer, and also you have also in low energy ion scattering spectroscopy preferential sputtering, and so you can enrich you know, one element versus another just by selectively splitting one away and the other one. And so uh, how reliable is it? The outer surface, agree, okay? Yeah. But uh, how reliable how, you know, is it, how confident, much confidence you have when you start chewing away the material, and all kind of things can, uh, can happen. And then it's a vacuum too, right. on top of that. Well, uh, I wish you had a saw was here, but, uh, but he's not. I think uh, uh, in probably 20 plus years of his experience with us, I think they were able to basically look at the sputtering effect by looking at essentially glass type structures that don't have preferential uh, uh, compositional changes as a function of depth. They were able to convince themselves that essentially what's important is that the instance of uh, of a sparring ion, which is, for example, argon flops, or could be neon or anything like that, that essentially the moment this ion collides with the surface ion, uh, it, it knocks it out of the surface. Okay? So there's very little preference in uh, one element versus another one being knocked out of the surface. And I and, and basically, but what happens is, of course, uh, you have a statistical distribution for that profile. So essentially what, what happens is when you uh, uh, sputter off the first layer, uh, you can, at, at low conversion, so to speak, of removal of that first layer, you can remove preferentially that layer. But once a significant fraction of subsurface is, is exposed, then you begin to sputter away the subsurface layer. So it becomes uh, averaged over a couple layers. So the issue is not uh, selective removal of one ion from a specific surface layer versus another one as the statistical nature of the removal of, of those ions. 
So, and I think basically the, the scrambling effect becomes more significant as you try to scram, as you try to remove more and more layers. And so basically, you cannot you cannot reliably remove more than two three layers before you you basically have a very uh, uh, you know, considerably effective scrambling. But I think the first couple layers you can you can be uh, reasonably confident in, in these results. So I don't believe in I don't think there's the a masses there's a, are so different. You know, huh? The masses are so different. The looking the Canadian solarium is dealing with the whole even the proxy. Well, I think uh, I think what's important is that if you if you look at uh, if you look at something like that, what you see is that you begin here at the top of the surface without any kind of uh, sputtering treatment, and then you're right here at the bottom. Okay, so you know the range is reasonably narrow in, in concentrations. Uh, again, with, looking at that carefully, uh, you say that Bali is 50% and, and the Gulf and the Indian is 40%, but the ratio is not, anyway, it's not close, but it's not the bone giant in the whole composition. The piece is a three component system. It's uh, it's more than five. It's twice as much on the Indian as you do there, in the bone composition. Now, that's a minor piece. I, I just want to. This is this is synthesis composition. This is not the bulk composition. Okay. Okay. But the real composition can't be analyzed. Well, this is it. This is the bulk composition. Uh, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. In I just want to make a comment to the audience here that uh, the theme is pretty modest, but the way people have done oxide catalysis for 30, 40 years just with XRD. And what this talk shows is that it's useless, that the surface is what you have to know. And what he's doing and he's developing is a way to do that and to actually see what the active sites are and, and quantify them, determine them. And this is, it means that all these models, like people like Roselli are wrong. And, and that's already, this wave is starting to change. And that meeting that you talked about, the ACS meeting in last year, that Schleudel and so on. Everybody is pretty much opening up their eyes that the way we've been doing things for 40 years is wrong. And this is leading the way to the way of thinking and research. Very well, important contribution. Thank you. Well, I, I think uh, one does need to look at the surface to clarify what the active surface sites are before utilizing hypothetical models. So the Roselli model for the active surface in the end may be, may be correct. It just one needs to look at it's hypothetical. There's no, there's no basis for it. There's no supporting data. And that merits, that should not merit any more uh, <coughs> recognition beyond that. It's hand -way. I think it's a great uh, reason to continue discussion. But let's take a little uh, coffee break. We can really continue discussion. Thanks for